Hi, and welcome to Crash Course Cryptozoology. It's undoubted that many of you who are watching this are aware of the Loch Ness eDNA study results, which were published on September 5th of this year. And as many of you know, these results carry with them a lot of implications. That being said, it's not being talked about much to the length that it truly exceeds itself to. There's a lot to unpack in the results alone, and the reactions and implications, those are discussion for another day on this channel. One of the crucial things that people should be aware of is what was cataloged in Loch Ness in this study, and what does it say about the Loch as an ecosystem? Perhaps it should be first understood that Loch Ness is quite a unique ecosystem. It is Scotland's largest lake by its massive depth. What also makes it unique, however, is that aside from very narrow channels, such as Inverness, Loch Ness has always been landlocked. It was formed during the end of the Pleistocene as the glaciers began to melt. Loch Ness itself was one of these melting glaciers. And equally, uh, anything that's in here now has to have come in after the last 10,000 years, which is when the last ice melted. This was one big glacier once, one big ice cube. And so the, the fish we have in here, and the creatures we have in here, are from the sea. And there have never been any saltwater amphibians that we know about. The fact that there are very narrow channels open to the ocean to this basically completely freshwater lake is really interesting because as you'll find out, that results in a lot of mingling between species. And it's a mingling that really says a lot about the loch as a wildlife habituation area. Before the results are stated, it seems necessary to go over the actual project, what it was and who was involved. Around a year and a half ago, Neil Gemmel, who is a professor from the University of Otago in New Zealand, announced he had gotten a team of scientists from around the world, including author Adrian Shines from Scotland, who's spoken a lot about Loch Ness, to conduct an eDNA sweep of the body of water. For those who are unaware, eDNA refers to environmental DNA. Environmental DNA, quite simply, is the DNA that an organism leaves behind as it travels through its environment. For instance, walking across the floor will leave some of your DNA on the floor, and that would be your eDNA. The team spent a few weeks scouring the lock on a boat and taking water samples every so often. Most of that year and a half was spent actually reading those results, cataloging the species in them, and coming up with a very interesting list of the species discovered in that search. All in all, according to Neil Gimmel's team, they identified 11 species of fish, 3 species of amphibians, 22 species of birds, and 19 species of mammals. These numbers also exclude the incredible amount of microbiodiversity that they found as well. More than any other species, we had a great abundance of bacteria in these results. Perhaps the most interesting of which being a type of bacteria associated with salty waters, not with fresh water. Again, we're seeing a good amount of mingling here, and that's quite interesting because that says that there are a considerable amount of organisms coming in from the ocean into Loch Ness and possibly leaving again. For those of you wondering, the mammals detected included dogs, sheep, cattle, badgers, deer, etc. Mostly because these animals tend to go for a swim in the loch occasionally. The same can be said of birds and of course amphibians and fish, which are a bit more full time with their swims. It should be noted that there was no reptile DNA discovered in Loch Ness. It should also be noted that there is no sign of sturgeons, catfish, or Greenland sharks in the water. It seems reasonable to say that we can now rule out Greenland sharks, oversized catfish, oversized sturgeons, and plesiosaurs as candidates for Nessie, as no DNA pertaining to any of these species has been discovered. That being said, it is important to note that eDNA is difficult to read after a period of a few weeks. There could be organisms coming in and out of the lock that are leaving DNA that simply didn't get read because their DNA became inviable. However, this is highly unlikely because with the frequency of the reports in the lock right now, we would surely have found a bit of eDNA of any of those species. We did not. Alongside with bacteria though, what was found was a great overabundance of eels. It is likely that many of these eels are European eels as they are the most common that come into the lock. Conger eels probably also provide a good deal of the DNA that we have. And that would be the summary of the DNA that was discovered in Loch Ness. Now, there are implications that this DNA has, especially to what it says about the ecosystem. It says that Loch Ness is indeed, even in its own wildlife biodiversity, a very unique ecosystem that hasn't been fully explored yet. Its implications get even more specific when taking into consideration the abundance of certain species in the loch. 
it gives us a bit of a window into what might be the only plausible explanation left for Loch Ness Monster sightings, if we are to consider that these sightings are actually a new species of some kind. Again, this is a discussion for another day. I hope that this video leaves you with a better knowledge of how DNA is studied, but most of all, I hope that it gives you an impression that even if there are no such things as Loch Ness Monsters, Loch Ness is a very amazing environment. And that alone makes it a very special place. That being said, until next time.